Listening Comprehension for Scientific English by Jonathan Upjohn Unit 11 in Personal Forms Something for Nothing Part 1 Keywords Alloy To Attempt Broad Clockwise To Cool to fit, flow, insight, lever, output, remove, to seek, new words, Overbalanced Ascent Greedy Alas Do you recognize these homographs? Lysenko Architect Ramp Thermodynamics. Part 2 Exercises. Now listen to the text and answer the questions. Stop the recording when necessary. Unit 11 Something for Nothing. Faraday, Madame Curie, Einstein are among the great heroes of science, those who had the major insights and made the essential breakthroughs. But what about the failures? Think of all those men and women who were totally wrong and who, year after year, attempted to do what in fact was impossible. For example, Lysenko, the Soviet scientist, who spent his whole life struggling to prove that the transmission of genetic characteristics fitted in with Marxist-Leninist theory. Or the alchemists, who sought to turn lead into gold. Or finally, those romantic but greedy people who wanted to get something for nothing, who spent their lives addressing an impossible problem, searching for perpetual motion. Here is Harriet Green to give us a brief overview. Well, very broadly speaking, perpetual motion refers to this idea that somehow it might be possible to produce a machine with an efficiency of 100% or more, more output than input the dream of limitless energy, virtually free. But before we go on, there are one or two points I would like us to get clear. The first is about superconducting. As you know, certain metals and alloys are superconductors, that is to say that their electrical resistance is reduced to zero at their transition temperatures, usually below 20K. In this sense, it's true that a current flowing in a superconducting ring will flow as long as the transition temperature is maintained. But of course the energy that must be spent on cooling is always greater than any work that might be obtained from superconducting flows. The second source of confusion is related to planets, satellites and so on. Objects in space which move in a frictionless atmosphere are not considered to be examples of perpetual motion. The term only refers to man-made appliances. But it's still not quite clear to me why so many people spend so much time and energy on the idea. After all, it seems pretty obvious that it just can't work. Well, if you look at it from a historical perspective, it becomes more understandable. You see, prior to the 19th century, there was no obvious reasons why they should not be built. We now know that such devices are theoretically impossible, because according to the first law of thermodynamics, energy cannot be created and conversely, it cannot be destroyed. However, this law was only formulated in the 19th century. Could you give us one or two examples of attempts to create perpetual motion? The oldest recorded perpetual motion machine is that of a 13th century French architect, Villard de Hornecourt. His idea was that of the overbalanced wheel. He was convinced that more energy could be extracted from the downward movement of a falling weight on one side of a wheel than is required to raise the weight on the other. As you can see in figure one, a wheel with a radius of 
let's say 40 centimeters, spins on an axis R. Attached to the outer edge of the wheel are articulated arms that increase the radius of the wheel by 70 centimeters. When one of the arms reaches A, a metal ball is loaded onto the extended tip, E. Due to the pressure exerted by the weight of the ball, the wheel moves in a clockwise direction. After turning through 90 degrees, the wheel begins the ascent. However, because of the articulations, the arms do not remain extended. They swing downwards. When the wheel has turned through a further 90 degrees, just after passing G, the ball rolls onto a ramp and is transferred back to the initial position. And so the cycle starts once again. This system is based on the assumption that by altering the radius of the wheel, more energy is exerted at E since the weight is farther removed from the axis during the downward cycle. Can you tell us about other systems? Magnetism was another favourite idea. In this example, figure 2, a magnet, M, was placed at the top of a gradient. The magnetic force, F, was supposed to draw a steel ball, let's call it B, up a smooth inclined ramp. However, there was a hole, H, at the top of the ramp. It was assumed that the force of gravity, G, would be strong enough to pull the ball through the hole and allow it to escape and slide back on another ramp to the starting point. Mechanical energy could be produced by a mechanism J actuated by the ball during its fall. I believe that water was also widely used. I mean using hydrodynamic and capillary principles. In 1686, Labbé de la Roque suggested building a glass tank shaped like an inverted pyramid, or to be more accurate, a cone. This would have a large surface area and be filled with water. Conversely, the bottom of the tank would be small. Coming out of the bottom of the tank Y, there would be a pipe with a very narrow cross-section X leading back to a few millimetres above the surface level Z. This pipe would feed the water coming from Y back into the tank. According to the Abbey, the surface area W being greater than X, there should be sufficient pressure to induce a flow of liquid from Y to Z. But, as you said earlier, we now know that it just can't work, that it's theoretically impossible. Yes, alas, these rather romantic ideas have now been abandoned. In fact, as early as 1775, all communications concerning perpetual motion were banned by the French Academy of Sciences. However, before we laugh too much at the stupidity of these men, it ought to be remembered that in the past, the notion of perpetual motion was seriously discussed by such people as Helmholtz, Leonardo da Vinci, Carnot, Maxwell and even Isaac Newton himself.